Good evening, everyone. As I mentioned before, my name is Tom Ulrich. I'm the Associate Director for Science Communications here at the Broad Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here this, this evening and to welcome everybody who's watching on YouTube uh, for the fifth in our Broad at 15 <coughs> talk series. The Broad was a uh, the Broad came into being in 2004, so in the last 15 years we've seen some amazing progress in many fields of biomedicine and, and, uh, and biology. And these talks are basically intended to help celebrate that amazing pace of scientific progress and some of the parts that the Broad Institute has played in it. It's my pleasure to welcome this evening our, uh, our two speakers, David Liu and Feng Zhang. Both David and Feng are core institute members here at the Broad Institute. Uh, David is also the director of our Merkin Institute for Transformative Technologies in Healthcare, as well as our chemical, and bio chemical Biology and Therapeutic Science program. And he's also a professor of chemistry and chemical biology at Harvard University. Fung is also an investigator at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT, right across the street. He's the James and Patricia Poitras Professor of Neuroscience at MIT, as well as an associate professor of brain and cognitive sciences and biological engineering. Together, David and Fung are going to talk about technologies for editing the genome, the amazing evolution of those technologies over the last 15 years, and some of the ethical and societal questions that those technologies raise. Uh, if you have any questions for David and Fung after their talk, uh, we ask that you, if you're in the room, just raise your hand and one of our mic runners will come to you with a microphone or also text your questions to the uh, number on the screen. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can also uh, enter your questions via YouTube chat. And if you're tweeting this evening, we just ask you to please use the hashtag Broad at 15. And without further ado, David, come on up. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. I can't see you because of the lights, but it's a pleasure to see so much interest in, uh, in this topic. A defining characteristic of human nature is our desire to understand and address our problems. And mutations in our DNA pose serious problems to many individuals, families, and communities. Some of these mutations arise spontaneously, uh, others are inherited, but in either case, we have little control over their occurrence. And until recently, we lacked the ability to precisely manipulate the DNA in living systems as complex as human beings. Over the, cap over the past couple decades, however, our ability to not only understand, but to actually fix mutations in our DNA has advanced tremendously. Tonight, Fanjan and I will overview how basic science discoveries about natural bacterial defense systems, combined with some human ingenuity, have uh, resulted in a new era of modern genome editing. All right, as a little bit of a primer, uh, the complete set of nucleic acid instructions in a living system is called a genome. The genome of an organism is typically organized into one or more chromosomes. Almost all of your cells have 23 pairs of chromosomes, one set from mom and one set from dad, that collectively contain two sets of three billion DNA base pairs, uh, or DNA letters. A useful analogy is that a genome is like a book, a chromosome is like a chapter within the book, and a gene is like a sentence within one chapter. These sentences and chapters encode the molecules of life. The physical manifestation of a gene is typically a segment of DNA that encodes a protein. Nearly all of the molecules within living systems are either directly encoded by DNA or are molecules that are generated by the actions of proteins and therefore are indirectly encoded by DNA. DNA is therefore the molecular answer to one of the most important and thought-provoking questions about life. How can living systems, which are three-dimensional, highly parallel, and full of analog inputs and outputs, be encoded by a linear digital stream of information? Because DNA is the script for life, the ability to manipulate DNA in living systems is very powerful. Much of today's talk will describe one such capability called targeted genome editing. Targeted genome editing is the ability to introduce specific changes into a target DNA sequence in living cells. And until recently, this capability did not exist for most organisms. 
Targeted genome editing is poised to transform many aspects of our society. Research into the mysteries of biology and disease can be greatly accelerated by editing the animals and the cells that support much of biomedical research. So we can assess what happens to a cell or to this mouse when we introduce mutations that we suspect cause diseases in people. The development of more nutritious or higher <laughs> yielding crops could be also facilitated by genome editing, improving agriculture. And because thousands of diseases are known to arise from mutations in our DNA, the ability to correct these mutations is poised to treat, or perhaps even cure, many grievously ill patients. A major challenge, however, is that real DNA, the DNA in your cells, looks nothing like a strain of letters in a book. Instead, real DNA is a lumpy, complex molecule made of atoms that together form strains of DNA bases, A, C, G, or T. <coughs> About 20 DNA base pairs are shown here. And it's not at all obvious how you might find a unique target DNA sequence, just one particular set of lumps, within the vast sea of six billion base pairs in each of our cells. And even if you could locate such a target sequence, how would you change that sequence precisely into a different DNA sequence of your choosing? Fawn will now describe how scientists illuminated and then co-opted bacterial immune systems to, enter, to, to create new tools that could not only find, but actually modify target DNA sequences in living cells. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, David. <laughs> a lot of the challenges that we face with genome editing, um, there are solutions that exist in nature. And so I put this picture up, um, just want to show and highlight that if we just look around us, look at the diversity that nature has created, things that have evolved over billions of years, um, each one of these uh, living things have created or invented a clever mechanism to allow it to survive uh, in the natural wild. And by looking into the natural diversity, finding these interesting mechanisms, some of them, scientists uh, over decades of study and, and uh, engineering have turned into very powerful uh, technologies. So the solutions for, for uh, achieving genome editing uh, lies in a lot of these uh, natural uh, diversities. So where did I start? So I, I was born um, in China um, many years ago, and uh, I was... <laughs> I was fortunate uh, to, to uh, move to the U.S. with my parents when I was a uh, teenager. So when I was 11, I uh, moved from this really crowded um, uh, place uh, to uh, somewhere that's much more uh, zen-like. So in Iowa, uh, <laughs> where I landed, I was a lot more, um, a lot more calm. And, uh, and there are lots of cornfields and, and lots of uh, cattle. There were more cows than human uh, that lived in the state of Iowa. Uh, joking aside, um, Iowa was a great place to grow up as a kid. Um, I enrolled in the public school, um, and it's in the public school that's where I first learned about molecular biology. Um, in our school, uh, there are these Saturday enrichment programs, probably programs designed for, uh, for kids uh, and also for, for parents who want to have the kids out of the house for the, over the weekend for, <laughs> for a few hours um, to, to learn about something that they're curious about. And so uh, one of these classes uh, had a title, Molecular Biology. I actually really didn't like biology uh, because to me, uh, life science in middle school was about memorizing uh, different leaves and uh, dissecting smelly frogs. Uh, none of these were, were really uh, all that exciting to me. I like to take things apart and, and put it back together to figure out how to build things. So going to this class um, at, uh, on Saturdays, uh, we started to learn about all of the advances that were happening in biology. People were discovering DNA, discovering uh, what DNA, how DNA encoded protein, and basically how um, life is made of molecules and encoded by the, by the blueprint uh, of our genome. It's through learning about these new principles that people are discovering about biology and watching documentaries like Jurassic Park that we started, <laughs> that, that I got really excited. Um, the concepts that were illustrated in these science fiction movies uh, was really exciting. Um, it didn't feel like it was all that uh, remote and all that sort of unlikely. 
So the teacher who was teaching the Saturday enrichment class um, uh, remembered that I was really fascinated about molecular biology. And so by the time I became a high school student, uh, he came to me and said, well, there's a great opportunity um, for you to learn more about molecular biology. Um, it turned out uh, in one of the hospital systems in Des Moines called Iowa Methodist Medical Center, uh, there is a gene therapy research lab. And within this gene therapy lab, um, you can, uh, students can sign up to become a volunteer in the afternoon uh, and, and work with uh, the scientists or, or the doctors uh, that are working there. And so I signed up and I began to work with um, my first mentor, uh, Dr. John Levy, uh, who um, taught me uh, side by side um, what DNA is, how to uh, manipulate DNA and look at cells under a microscope, and also uh, putting green fluorescent proteins into these cells to make them uh, glow green. So the Gene Therapy Research Institute was focused on using molecular biology and also the latest advances in our understanding of viruses to be able to deliver therapeutic genes into patients. And so for instance, um, scientists there were engineering viruses to be able to deliver a, a toxic gene into tumor cells so that they can get rid of tumor uh, for, for ovarian cancer patients and also for uh, brain cancer patients. And so it's through working with John and also the, all of the scientists there that I began to learn about what scientific research and molecular biology um, applications for medicine is, is really all about. So those types of gene therapy allow us to put a therapeutic gene uh, into the body. But sometimes genetic diseases are caused by mutations in our DNA. And so we can't just put a, a gene back in, we actually have to go and try to fix uh, these DNA sequences. And so one of the things to make this possible is through the development of uh, gene editing uh, technologies. So the genome uh, is, is a, lot of, a long string of letters. And so if that string of letters was in your, in your computer, in Microsoft Word, it's quite easy to edit it. You open up the search function, you can type in the typo, it will place the cursor in where that typo is, and then you can backspace to delete, or you can type in a new sequence. So how do you do this um, chemically uh, in the genome of a cell? Scientists have been working on developing uh, genome editing technologies for several decades now. And multiple generations of these technologies uh, have been developed. But the core challenge is how do you easily target, or how do you easily place the cursor in exactly where you want to edit uh, in the genome? So scientists have been uh, developing um, different uh, generations of technologies. And, and so the core challenge is how do you easily find that piece of um, DNA that you want to find in the genome? So some of the earlier um, technologies are called meganucleases or zinc finger nucleases uh, or, or transcription activator like effector nucleases. These are all protein-based DNA search uh, systems. So that means you have to design a whole protein in order to find that specific DNA sequence that you're trying to edit uh, within a cell. Turns out proteins are very difficult to engineer. And so even though these technologies show that it's possible to edit DNA, uh, it was not very easy to do. And in fact, uh, even for some of these systems like seeing finger nucleases, it used to cost more than $15,000 uh, just to get something that may not even work very well. The latest generation technology is based on uh, a different system. It's called CRISPR, and it's from uh, bacterial uh, cells, and bacteria use them to defend against different types of viruses. The beauty of CRISPR is that rather than having to design proteins, there's one fixed protein. You don't have to change it, and you can give it a new piece of RNA, and then that RNA can direct the protein to find uh, the specific sequence that you want to have uh, in, in the genome. These RNA can be quite easily synthesized uh, through chemical means, so you can even just go online to a website, type in a sequence, and then in a couple of days, within a FedEx envelope, uh, you'll get a tube of that, that DNA. So, um, so anyway, so where is CRISPR uh, from? Um, turns out that CRISPR uh, is found in over 60% of bacteria and over 90% of archaeo cells. These are all microorganisms. And those of you who have had a bowl of yogurt for breakfast, uh, you ate CRISPR uh, this morning. <laughs> Turns out that um, you know, all of the yogurt that's on the store shelves have been immunized against viruses through the CRISPR mechanism, through the natural mechanism, by exposing these cells to viruses called phages. And then CRISPR remembers these phages by taking a snippet of the DNA and putting it into the bacteria's genome. And that gives the bacterial cell immunity against that phage in the future. 
So if the industry is trying to make a big fermenter full of yogurt, um, it's, it doesn't have to worry so much about getting contaminated because a new phage, a new virus, uh, got into that, that, uh, that fermenting culture. So I have a short video here that shows how uh, CRISPR um, works in the bacterial cell to defense, defend against these viruses. And so here is a virus that latched onto a bacterial cell. And so the first thing it will do is to inject its DNA uh, into this bacterial cell. Now, the CRISPR system has seen this virus, if it has seen this virus before, it will have acquired snippets of the virus's sequences. And so these snippets can become uh, RNA and then work with this protein called Cas9 to form a surveillance immune complex. And it's this complex that can then go and search along uh, the, the, the virus DNA. And if this RNA, this red piece, matches with the DNA, virus DNA uh, in blue, then the enzyme will become activated, and then it will cl uh, clip the virus DNA and cut it into uh, two pieces. That circumvents virus replication and protects the bacterial cell uh, from, from this uh, virus. It's this mechanism that allows us to use this RNA to direct the protein to, piece, to a piece of DNA that makes it uh, so much easier uh, to be able to uh, achieve genome editing. And so, Based on uh, all of these work uh, done by many scientists over uh, many, uh, several decades, um, scientists have now been able to harness this complex, engineering the protein, engineering the RNA, uh, introducing them into the nucleus of human cell, and then getting them to be able to target the DNA on the genome of the human cell. And then after the RNA matches this DNA, then the enzyme will get activated and will make a double-stranded cut uh, within the human genomic DNA. This double-stranded cut is the cursor that we place in the genome. Wherever you cut, that's where, where you can insert or delete a DNA sequences. So the first method to repair is to use the cell's own machineries to be able to re-glue the two ends together, but making a small mutation in that process. That small mutation allows uh, scientists to be able to inactivate a specific gene so that we can get rid of something that is deleterious uh, in the genome. The second uh, uh, pathway, also taking advantage of the cell's own machinery, is by putting in a synthetic piece of DNA um, that you make chemically, and then this DNA matches the two broken ends, but it can also carry a new piece of DNA sequence that you want to switch in. And so very precisely through this second uh, mechanism, a new piece of DNA sequence can get incorporated uh, into the genome to be able to repair uh, DNA sequences. And so this is how this bacterial immune system has been co-opted uh, for achieving um, uh, genome editing uh, within the cells. So um, this technology um, has really caught the attention of many scientists from around the world and is now being used uh, very broadly in many different application areas. First and foremost is the application of this technology in basic research. Scientists um, here at Brody Institute at MIT and also in many other research institutions around the world are now using it to be able to generate uh, all sorts of animal models. Um, before, uh, scientists were mostly working with mice uh, as an animal model to study biology. But now, scientists have been able to use it to make all sorts of animal models from, from mice to um, all the way to non-human uh, primates to really find the best model to study the specific biology uh, that the scientist is interested in, in understanding, and also to be able to model disease in a much more accurate uh, fashion. Just to give you a sense of the acceleration that CRISPR has provided for scientists, it used to take a scientist up to a year to be able to make a mouse model. And now, using CRISPR, scientists can make it within three weeks. And so for graduate students, you can imagine that is a huge advantage. Uh, they can tackle many more questions within five years of a PhD uh, versus maybe only a couple, uh, studying a couple of models within that uh, same period of time. Of course, uh, one of the most exciting uh, applications of CRISPR is the application to uh, disease treatment. And so through um, the work of many scientists to understand how human genetic differences contribute to disease, uh, scientists are now identifying specific changes that if, were, if they were introduced into genome, uh, can confer uh, therapeutic uh, benefits. And so one of these genes is called PCSK9, and it's the target uh, of, of, um, of two uh, protein therapeutics uh, for reducing cholesterol and improving uh, heart health. And so uh, by, by what people have found is that those individuals who carry 
uh, this mutation in the gene called PCSK9 have naturally reduced levels, levels of cholesterol. And so if you can put that mutation back in uh, to, the, uh, to someone who has high heart disease risk, that you may be able to significantly improve their, their health. And so we try to see whether or not uh, we can use gene editing as a way to achieve this. And so uh, what I have done is to take a virus, we gut it out, um, everything that's pathogenic about this virus, and we put into the virus uh, the, the gene editing system CRISPR. And we, we program that CRISPR system with a, a guide that directs the protein to this gene called PCSK9. So we made up the virus and we injected it uh, through the tail vein into a mouse so that we can target liver cells in this mouse and see, can we introduce this mutation and then lower the cholesterol level uh, within this mouse? So this is what uh, the, data, the data looks like. This is the PCSK9 protein level in the blood. We're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get rid of PCSK9 uh, from, from uh, the blood of these mice. In the control condition, so this is a mouse that didn't receive the gene editing system, uh, this is what, what we see. So, um, you know, for a number of days before injection, um, this is the PCSK9 level. It fluctuates a little bit, but it hovers around uh, about 100. And then on day zero, uh, or day one, is when we inject uh, into this mouse. And you can see um, after injection of something that doesn't target the PCSK9 gene, uh, the protein remains about the same uh, in the mouse. Now, if we put in uh, the virus that carries a CRISPR that targets PCSK9, uh, then this is what you see. So on day one, we inject, and then after injection, um, we no longer see PCSK9 protein within this mouse. And so this shows that we can use this system to very effectively um, introduce a mutation to fully uh, get rid of PCSK9. And then this effect is permanent. So for the rest of the time points that we measure, um, this effect persists. So through a single dose, uh, you can achieve a very long-lasting uh, therapeutic uh, outcome. So in addition to using uh, CRISPR, and, and so, so CRISPR is now being very actively developed uh, in the pharmaceutical context for, for the treatment of many different diseases. And David will tell you more about some of the most recent uh, exciting outcomes that have come out of CRISPR uh, therapeutic trials. In addition to therapeutic applications, uh, CRISPR is also uh, widely used in agriculture to try to improve uh, crops. And so here are just two examples of what scientists have already accomplished. Uh, one is to make uh, non-browning mushrooms. Um, you have all seen mushrooms that brown a little bit. And by introducing a naturally present um, uh, genetic difference, uh, we can make a mushroom that, that don't brown um, easily. Um, soybeans have also been modified by introducing specific variations. Um, you can make um, heat-tolerant uh, soybeans and also make soybeans that produce more oleic acid, uh, so make them uh, even healthier uh, as, a, as a crop. So that um, is also being used very broadly. People are now engineering tomatoes and, and rice and many other crops uh, to try to make them more uh, sustainable and also uh, improve uh, the agricultural yield. All of this is done uh, through a protein uh, called Cas9. Uh, but CRISPR refers to many different types of uh, bacterial immune systems. So Cas9 is one example, but then there's a, there are many other uh, different types of CRISPR systems. Uh, another one is called Cas13. Uh, Unlike Cas9, uh, Cas13 targets RNA molecules inside the cells instead of DNA molecules. And, and this property allows Cas13 to be turned into a very nice diagnostics technology to be able to quickly look for whether or not a virus or a bacterial pathogen is present in blood, urine, uh, or saliva. And so this is what these uh, uh, diagnostic test strips look like. Uh, you, look, you look to see whether or not uh, a line shows up, very much like a pregnancy uh, test uh, strip, um, and you can see whether or not um, a, a disease is present. And so here's a short clip that shows how, how this diagnostic technology works. So this is the Cas13 enzyme. You can program it with the RNA guide to recognize uh, a virus or a bacterial pathogen's uh, DNA se uh, RNA sequence. And then when the guide RNA recognizes uh, the virus RNA, it turns the protein on. And this protein will then cleave other RNA molecules. So now you can engineer a reporter RNA that has two, um, two reporting ends. Upon cleaving this reporter RNA, then the, uh, the two ends can report an, an output. And so you can apply this reaction onto the paper strip where these molecules flow across this paper strip. And if the virus is present, then a line will appear and because these molecules get captured on this paper strip. And so 
by looking to see whether or not on this lateral flow-based uh, diagnostic test strip, a new line showed up. Uh, you can very easily um, uh, develop a diagnostic to see uh, does a person have influenza virus, uh, or you can use this to quite quickly uh, see whether uh, design, develop a test to see if someone has the, the new coronavirus uh, that that's been being report uh, that's been reported in the in the news uh, recently. So anyway, so those are just some examples of how uh, scientists have been able to mine from nature uh, to then turn nature's inventions. Uh, engineer them into useful uh, biotechnology uh, to improve uh, human health uh, in many different uh, application areas. So now I'll turn it back to David, who will uh, continue to tell us about how um, CRISPR and genome editing uh, allows us to develop uh, really uh, powerful uh, therapeutic uh, methodologies. Great. Thank you, Fun. All right, so since the discovery and initial application of CRISPR systems, as beautifully summarized by Fawn, uh, scientists have engineered and evolved CRISPR tools in many powerful ways. A major motivation behind much of this innovation is the nature of mutations that cause human dis genetic diseases. There are currently more than 75,000 uh, such known variants, and they represent many different types of changes. Point mutations, which are simply swapping one DNA base for another base, account for about half of the known disease-associated mutations. Among the 12 possible ways to change one DNA letter into a different letter, the four most common ways collectively represent the large blue wedge of this pie chart. For example, a single C to T change in just one copy of one gene called lamin A uh, in your genome uh, causes progeria this devastating rapid aging disease that many of you have probably uh, heard about, which causes patients to pass away around the age 14. And even as toddlers, they already exhibit symptoms consistent with uh, elderly joint disease and heart disease. A different kind of single base swap, the mutation of an A uh, to a T in your hemoglobin genes, causes sickle cell anemia, which diminishes the lifespan and the quality of life of millions of, of patients. In addition to single base errors, uh, missing or extra DNA letters can also cause disease. The most common cause of cystic fibrosis is three missing DNA letters in a gene called CFTR. And just four extra DNA letters at a certain position in a gene called hex A is the most common cause of Tay-Sachs disease, a neurodegenerative disorder. So to apply targeted genome editing to truly study and correct as many disease-associated mutations as possible requires the development of many different editing capabilities. Fawn presented how CRISPR-Cas9 was first used as programmable molecular scissors that cut DNA sequences, uh, first of the bacteria's choosing and then of our choosing. In most cell types, cutting DNA leads to target gene disruption. This can be very useful for some applications, like the PCSK9 application that, that Fon described. But for most genetic diseases, disrupting the already mutated target gene is not expected to benefit patients. Instead, to restore normal gene function, we actually need to repair rather than further disrupt uh, the mutated gene. So to begin to address this challenge, our lab developed base editors. Uh, base editors are molecular machines that use the searching ability of CRISPR scissors to find a target gene. But instead of cutting the DNA, base editors directly convert one DNA letter to another letter. So if naturally occurring CRISPR proteins are like scissors, then you can think of base editors like pencils, uh, capable of directly rewriting one DNA base into another by actually rearranging the atoms in that DNA base to instead become a different base. Base editors don't exist in nature. Uh, we had to engineer the first class of base editor, which is called a cytosine base editor, from three separate proteins. We began by disabling the ability of the CRISPR scissors to cut the DNA double helix. It turns out it's very easy to break things. Uh, and we retain, though, the ability of the CRISPR scissors to search for and bind target DNA. Next, we linked the disabled CRISPR scissors, shown in blue, to a second protein in red, uh, which performs a chemical reaction on the DNA base C, converting it into a base that resembles T. Finally, we had to connect the first two proteins to a third protein, shown in purple, 
that prevents the cell from removing the edited base. So in addition to converting C into a base resembling T on one DNA strand, a base editor also nicks the non-edited strand, thereby causing the cell to replace the original G in this non-edited strand with an A as it remakes the nicked strand. So in this way, a base editor can cause the permanent conversion of an original CG base pair on both DNA strands into an edited TA base pair. Among the more than 37,000 or so known point mutations associated with disease currently, the two kinds of mutations that this first class of base editors can reverse, uh, turning Cs into Ts, uh, turning Gs into As, account for roughly 14% of, uh, of the total. Uh, but the largest fraction of point mutations that cause genetic diseases would require the development of a different type of base editor, one that converts A's into G's or T's into C's. It's actually the opposite of the changes made by the first base editors. This second class of base editors could, in theory, correct almost half of the known uh, pathogenic point mutations. When we began working on developing this second class of base editor, which is called an adenine base editor, we soon realized that while we could once again use the beautiful targeting mechanism of CRISPR scissors to bring a new base editor to a target sequence, unfortunately, there are no proteins that are known to convert A in DNA into a base that looks like G or to convert T into a base that looks like C. So given the absence of a naturally occurring protein that performs the chemistry we needed, we decided to evolve our own protein in the laboratory that converts A and DNA into a base resembling G, starting from an enzyme that performs related chemistry on RNA. We set up a Darwinian survival of the fittest evolution system that explores tens of millions of protein variants and only allows those rare variants that can perform the necessary chemical reaction to survive. After years of hard work, we succeeded in evolving the first protein, shown here, that directly converts the base A in DNA into a base that behaves like G. We could then combine this laboratory evolved protein with the disabled CRISPR scissors, again shown in blue, to generate this adenine base editor, which converts a target A into a G, and then uses the same strand nicking strategy that we developed for the first base editor to trick the cell into replacing the T on the other strand with a C, thereby completing the conversion of both strands of what used to be an AT base pair into what's now a stable GC base pair. All right, so these two classes of base editors can install or correct four of the most common kinds of single letter mutations that cause genetic diseases. But what about the rest of this pie chart, uh, which includes the eight remaining ways to swap one DNA letter for another letter, as well as the insertion of extra DNA bases, the deletion of DNA bases, and other types of genome changes that all can cause genetic diseases. To make these other types of changes at target sites in the genomes of living cells, our lab recently developed prime editors. So prime editors, like base editors, use, once again, the incredible DNA targeting ability of disabled CRISPR-Cas9. But instead of cutting DNA like Cas9, and instead of converting one base to another base like base editors, prime editors directly replace the original DNA sequence at the target site with a newly synthesized segment of DNA of our choosing. So this direct search and replace editing capability, just like the word processor that Fun envisioned, uh, makes uh, prime editors very versatile. They can make all 12 possible kinds of base-to-base -base changes. They can also make small insertions or small deletions, even in the same edit. So if CRISPR-Cas9 is like scissors and base editors are like pencils, you can think of prime editors to be like molecular word processors. Okay, so how do they work? To create prime editor proteins, we fused disabled CRISPR scissors, again shown in blue, 
with an engineered enzyme called a reverse transcriptase, shown in red. In addition, we engineered a special prime editor guide RNA, or PEG RNA for short, which not only specifies the target DNA site, the way that it's a guide RNA does in natural CRISPR systems, but the PEG RNA also encodes the desired edit that you wish to make uh, in the target DNA site. The prime editor protein and the PEG RNA together form a complex that binds to target DNA, just like natural CRISPR-Cas9. But instead of cutting the target DNA, prime editors nick just one strand of DNA near the site of the desired edit. And then they used the freshly nicked DNA to prime or initiate reverse transcription. Reverse transcription copies the edited sequence within the PEG RNA directly into the target DNA site, one base at a time. The result is an edited DNA flap, which is shown in green here, that's attached to the original DNA sequence in blue. The redundant non-edited DNA segment is naturally excised by the cell, resulting in a mismatched DNA double helix in which one DNA strand has the edit we want in green and the other strand is still unedited. To resolve this mismatch in a way that favors the edited DNA, you can probably already guess what's coming, we use the same strategy that we used uh, for base editors. Uh, so prime editors will nick the non-edited strand, coaxing the cell to remake that strand using the edited DNA strand as a template, and the result is fully edited uh, DNA, double-stranded DNA, with the edit present in both DNA strands of the double helix. Because the edited sequence within the PEG RNA can be chosen to differ from the original sequence in any number of ways, one can use prime editors to make a wide range of edits, including insertions, deletions, replacements, or mixtures of these changes. The CRISPR-enabled editing tools summarized in our talk have been made freely available to academic researchers. And to date, more than 60,000 of these CRISPR editing constructs in the form of DNA blueprints have been distributed to more than 10,000 requesting laboratories around the world. Thousands of research papers using these tools in organisms ranging from bacteria to plants to mice to primates have already been published, resulting in many new discoveries about living systems, including ways to improve crops, like Fun described, new insights into how certain mutations can cause disease. Pathogenic mutations in many animal models of human genetic diseases have already been corrected using these tools. And in some cases, uh, these corrections of the animal model rescue the resulting animals from the symptoms of the disease. Perhaps most remarkable, all of these advances using CRISPR for genome editing that we've presented uh, so far this evening have occurred in only the past seven and a half years, uh, which is something that's uh, truly remarkable as a career scientist. As with any powerful new technology, the advent of CRISPR-mediated genome editing raises many key questions, a few of which we'll touch on in the remainder of this talk, and we're happy to, uh, to engage uh, with you during the question and answer period to uh, go into further depth on many of these questions. As genome editing technologies have grown more capable and begin to enter human clinical trials, uh, defining what kinds of changes to our genome should we make will become increasingly important. Should we limit edits to those that reverse mutations that cause grievous genetic diseases? What about installing edits that lower your disease risk? Or edits that improve other human capabilities beyond disease resistance? What are all the edits, what are all the risks associated with making each desired change, as well as unwanted changes that might accompany the desired edits? What other scientific advances are needed beyond creating the machines that can correct the mutations to safely and effectively treat the largest possible number of genetic diseases in human patients? Should we limit editing efforts to somatic cells? These are the cells in your body that do not pass their DNA onto your progeny. Or should we allow editing of sperm and egg cells that would cause future generations who can't consent right now to inherit the edits? How can we maximize the fraction of society that benefits from genome edits 
uh, be it more nutritious food or cures for previously untreatable diseases. And finally, when will all of this happen? That last question is the easiest to answer because all of this is happening right now. We have already begun the era of human genome editing, accelerated by the editing capabilities that CRISPR has enabled. Genome editing agents, like all molecules, bind their targets with imperfect specificity, potentially result resulting in unwanted modifications at so-called off-target sites. While the vast majority of off-target DNA edits are not expected to cause harm to a patient, and while our genomes constantly accumulate billions of new mutations every day in our body, the use of genome editing in humans must only be done in ways that minimize the possibility of introducing harmful mutations. Fortunately, scientists have already developed effective strategies to both detect and to minimize off-target editing. Next-generation variants of CRISPR-Cas9 and base editors have already been shown to induce far fewer unwanted edits. And also delivering these agents in forms that last in cells just long enough to make the desired edits has also been shown to reduce off-target editing. These advances notwithstanding, it's important to thoroughly understand the consequences of both on-target and off-target edits whenever we contemplate human genome editing and weigh the potential risks against the anticipated benefit. An additional challenge facing the use of genome edits, uh, editing, uh, probably a challenge that you've already heard about, is the difficulty of delivering these editing agents into the cells of animals or human patients. The limitations of current delivery strategies are pretty strong constraints on the diseases that we can currently study or correct uh, using targeted genome editing. Unlike small molecules like ibuprofen or vitamin C, genome editing agents are all macromolecules, meaning they are much too large and too complex to be able to reach their targets simply by being eaten or even injected. Instead, we co-opt viruses to deliver these genome editing agents. Fawn already showed you a great example of that. Or we've developed special lipid nanoparticles to facilitate their entry into certain type of cells. Or scientists use electric fields to deliver editing agents into human cells in a dish, then transplant those edited cells back into a patient. But the fact that the major methods used to deliver genome editing agents into animals and patients can be summarized more or less on one slide here, uh, highlights to you just how urgent the need is to innovate new delivery technologies. <laughs> Questions of what we should edit and how we should edit human patients came to the forefront in late 2018 when a researcher announced that he had edited human embryos to disrupt a gene called CCR5, which encodes a protein used by HIV to infect human cells. The idea was to disrupt CCR5 in human embryos so that the resulting babies and their subsequent progeny would be resistant to HIV infection. The edited embryos were used to initiate pregnancies resulting in the birth of the first CRISPR edited human babies, two girls named Lulu and Nana. These events were a massive wake-up call to the genome editing community. Because the mother of these girls was HIV negative, there was really no unmet medical need for these patients. In addition, some of the presented data was inconsistent with the claims that Lulu and Nana had been edited in ways that conferred HIV resistance. Instead, the on-target edited forms of CCR5 in Lulu and Nana were not characterized thoroughly placing Lulu, Nana, and in principle, their future progeny at risk from adverse effects from these disrupted forms of CCR5. Finally, for such an important set of experiments, these studies were performed without sufficient community engagement. Now and in the future, we must do much better by fully engaging scientists, doctors, patients, ethicists, regulators, uh, before undertaking such efforts. And indeed, many scientists, including Fawn and myself, had called for a moratorium on editing human embryos to make genetically modified children 
at least while an international governance framework is developed that considers all of the critical responsibilities with such a powerful capability. Other early examples of human genome editing, fortunately, have been more encouraging. Just two months ago, early clinical trial results were announced from using CRISPR to edit stem cells from two patients with serious blood diseases, beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. In this trial, CRISPR scissors were used to cut and disrupt a DNA sequence that normally helps turn off the production of fetal hemoglobin around the time of birth. Now, turning off fetal hemoglobin uh, production is normal. It's happened for all of us. And it's inconsequential for people with, adult normal, with normal adult hemoglobin genes. But if your adult hemoglobin genes have mutations in them that render them broken, as is the case if you have beta thalassemia or sickle cell anemia, then reactivating your body's ability to produce fetal hemoglobin, which can compensate for missing or defective adult hemoglobin, can literally be a lifesaver. And in the first CRISPR clinical trial results revealed in the United States, using CRISPR in blood stem cells from these two patients to reactivate their production of fetal hemoglobin, shown in the dark blue bars in this graph, followed by transplantation of the edited cells back into the patients, appears to have been successful. And while these patients have been treated for less than a year now, or it's been less than a year since they were treated, uh, both patients show signs that they might actually be cured of their previously debilitating diseases. So the rapid evolution of genome editing technologies has led us into a new era, an era in which we can now edit our own genomes and the genomes of other organisms that impact our communities. We are at the fragile beginnings of this new era. Continued efforts to improve editing capabilities to understand the consequences, all the consequences of editing our genomes, to innovate new ways to deliver editing agents into cells, and to fully engage scientists, doctors, ethicists, governments, and other stakeholders will be crucial to guide our next steps and to ensure that these scientific advances can realize their full potential to benefit society. Thank you for your attention. We're now happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, David and Fung. Fung, why don't you come back up on stage? If you're in the room and you have a question, please raise your hand. And we have a pair of helpers uh, over here uh, that'll bring a microphone to you. Yes, over here. Hi, was there a light bulb moment when the idea gelled, or did it take a long time to develop the idea of CRISPR? Yeah, actually, um, I learned about CRISPR when I first arrived at abroad. Um, and it was in the, uh, in the conference room, not too far away from here that a scientist uh, was talking about his study of uh, interior coccus bacteria. And then um, he just casually mentioned, he wasn't studying CRISPR, but he just casually mentioned that CRISPR are these interesting nucleases that scientists were beginning to uh, figure out what they do. So I was getting bored in the meetings. I was in the back of the room and Googling CRISPR. And uh, when I started to, to try to read up on CRISPR and try to piece the things, uh, different information together, then I got really excited and, and I, uh, and, and that was the moment that I thought, um, if we can just turn this into a, into a tool, um, this will really transform uh, how people do genome editing. So sometimes drifting off in a meeting can be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Never David, happens. Dave, what got you interested in doing base editing? It was really, well, first I'm a chemist. So base editing is doing chemistry on the genome. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I think that was really a, a more of a mindset. The inspiration was recognizing that uh, cutting DNA can be very useful if you want to disrupt genes, but uh, in many cases, all we want to do is change one DNA letter back to another. And if you cut that place, you tend to mostly create products that, as Fawn mentioned, have uh, sort of uh, uncontrolled insertions and deletions, which is great if you want to disrupt a gene, but less useful if your goal is to just precisely correct one base and turn it into a different base. Okay. Anybody else in the audience? Yes, over here. When you repair the genes, do you need to repair all the cells or a subset of the cells? Yeah, so that really depends on the application. Mm -hmm. 
uh, biology, by its nature, tends to have a certain level of redundancy built in. So for some diseases, uh, for most diseases, you don't need to correct 100% of cells in the body. And in, in some diseases, for example, some genetic blindnesses, you may only need to correct a pretty small fraction, maybe 20% of uh, certain types of cells in your retina. For other diseases, like many that uh, require correction in the liver, the liver is an example of an organ where if you correct a small percentage of the cells, but those corrected cells are healthier, then over time they can actually take over the liver and you can end up with a fully healthy liver and potentially a cure for the disease. So it really varies. There are other diseases, they are not uh, currently great targets for genome editing, where you really want uh, virtually every cell in the body to be edited. And in those cases, we still need to uh, work on delivery, uh, this big issue that uh, occupied that one sad slide, uh, as well as uh, uh, improving the efficiency of, of editing. And of course, whenever you imagine, whenever you contemplate editing all the cells in a body, I think the bar is very high for, for needing to really understand exactly what the consequences of all that editing would be. We've had a couple of questions from the internet. Fung, um, can you talk a little bit about the differences between the different CASs? So CAS 12A, CAS 13, CAS 9, how do they, how do they differ? Sure, um, so CRISPR um, refers to this, this whole family of bacterial immune systems. And each type of immune system uses a different uh, molecule to be able to carry out the defense uh, activity. So CAS9, uh, which is kind of the main thing that we talked about here today, uh, targets DNA. And then there are other CRISPR systems like CAS13 that target RNA uh, because viruses come in both DNA and also RNA form. And some of these molecules have very interesting properties. Uh, for example, the CAS13 molecule, once it recognizes a piece of RNA, it will switch on and then cleave other RNA molecules. And once it cleaves it, it still stays on. It doesn't turn off like Cas9. Um, so what that means is uh, you can take advantage of this activity to then use it to, uh, to uh, cleave reporter molecules that either give off a glow of color or uh, changes the color on a, on a paper strip uh, to develop diagnostics uh, technologies. Um, or you can mutate it so that you can use this protein, um, uh, destroy the, the cutting function, and then use it to bring different types of um, what we call effectors to be able to edit RNA or to be able to modulate RNA, either silence it or, or make it more active. Um, so those are different ways where nature uh, have developed different molecules that we can repurpose uh, to, to build out a whole toolbox uh, for, for studying and also manipulating biology. And David, we had a question come in about prime editing and base editing and how precise they are. I mean, you mentioned chances for mistargeting with genome editing. How do, how do base and prime editors do when it comes to precision? Yeah, so uh, base editors and prime editors, because they use the searching mechanism of CRISPR, uh, they are prone to the same types of general off-target binding of DNA as, as CRISPR, uh, normal CRISPR scissors. Uh, but because there are additional requirements to get a base edit or a prime edit to work, uh, they tend to be less prone only a subset of the off-targets for using CRISPR scissors at a given target site uh, tend to actually lead to productive base editing or prime editing. The prime editing mechanism is particularly interesting because it actually requires not one check where the guide RNA has to match the DNA sequence, but it actually requires three checks, which if you were paying attention to the cartoon, there will be a quiz at the end and you can identify the three <laughs> events. Uh, and each of those uh, pairing events, each of those three pairing events provides an opportunity to reject an off-target sequence. So as you might imagine, uh, the result of having three checks uh, instead of one is that when we looked at known uh, CRISPR-Cas9 off-target sites for prime editing off-target uh, uh, activity, uh, we saw far less. Uh, but that's not the same as saying that there won't be off-targets uh, that prime editing might have on their own. We just haven't developed, the field hasn't developed uh, methods for detecting them in an unbiased uh, manner yet. And speaking of uh, developing methods and detecting methods, one of the other questions that's coming from YouTube. Uh, so by evolved proteins, you mean genetically modified proteins that allow you to do things that wouldn't other be found in nature? 
Yeah, that's right. So uh, researchers have uh, developed ways of uh, recapitulating the Darwinian evolution cycle in the laboratory, and in some cases, speeding it up dramatically. Uh, the Nobel Prize uh, was awarded a couple years ago uh, to a set of researchers who helped enable uh, protein evolution in the laboratory. And uh, uh, that capability has proven to be very powerful and very useful for engineering new properties and proteins that uh, nature doesn't provide. So that's exactly what we mean by evolved proteins. These are proteins that didn't evolve to do these kinds of changes or these capabilities in the laboratory, uh, sorry, in nature, but instead we've evolved them in the laboratory from starting points provided by nature to acquire these new functions or these new activities. All right. Let's see a couple of hands up in the middle. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, when scientists embark on such an ambitious project, such as uh, CRISPR, presumably in the beginning they, uh, they don't really know whether it's going to be realized or not. Um, and uh, yet they have to convince uh, PhDs and postdocs to actually uh, try, try and do it. Um, so I, I'm wondering, um, what are your criteria for realizability for a certain pr project? And uh, what, do, do you have like a set of, um, you have a recipe for, for, for in, before you start a project that it's, okay, I think this is going to be realized and thanks. Let's you answer first and then I can pitch in. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a very good question. I think, so science, uh, I think the way that we pursue science is to uh, find things that we find exciting and uh, things that are interesting. And oftentimes those are guided, um, at least for, uh, for um, sort of engineers and, and application uh, developers who are guided by real world problems. Um, for example, how do we correct DNA? Or how do we deliver a molecule into a cell? And so th those are the framing questions that we then try to imagine solutions that could go and solve the problem. Uh, once you start to think about a solution, then you kind of uh, read about it and you pressure test different ways that, uh, that a particular solution may not work. And, um, and if you find a fatal flaw, then, then that will, uh, you can persuade yourself not to do that. But if you can't find a fatal flaw, then, then you try it. And uh, as you collect more data, uh, you can see um, are there things that are different than what your, um, your imaginations are and they are, then you modify your approach uh, based on this new learning. Uh, and, and then that's how you uh, kind of move forward. Um, and um, you work with other people and um, have fun uh, while doing it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. I, I, I think um, uh, I'd much rather, and, and maybe the students who join uh, the types of labs that are working on these problems would much prefer to work on a problem that uh, is really important and that we feel really passionate about and even have it not work. Uh, if it doesn't work for the entire length of your PhD, that's not ideal, but, uh, <laughs> but if it doesn't work for even 90% of your PhD, usually that can end up, as long as you've chosen a really great problem, can still end up with a spectacularly successful PhD. So I think problem selection is ultimately what, what organizes uh, labs like ours. Uh, and I'll also just point out, uh, which I think Fun already uh, described, that Experimental science is full of failure. Uh, probably 95% of the raw experiments we do fail in some way. And uh, the, the, the key aspect to make progress is to be able to learn from repeated failure, to design experiments so that even, even if they fail, uh, you learn something that can help you uh, have a chance of, a better chance of succeeding in, in your next round of experiments. We have time for one more question. I so saw one more hand in the middle over here. So um, you and other researchers have called for a temporary moratorium on human germline gene editing. Um, but what circumstances would be necessary, in your opinion, um, to make human germline editing um, acceptable, basically, for society? Yeah. So <laughs> this is when I back away slowly. <laughs> Was it my turn now? Uh, so, so I, you know, I think the, to, to be clear, the moratorium that we are co-signatures, uh, the, the proposal for a moratorium uh, that Fun and I are, are, uh, are co-signatories on, uh, does not mean we think uh, nobody should ever edit human embryos uh, 
it, it does lay out a set of arguments for why, at least in the current uh, set of conditions, there are very few, if any, plausible situations you could imagine where, uh, given all of the other methods that we can use to, for example, pre-screen embryos, do genetic testing on them before implantation, uh, why it's very difficult to imagine plausible situations where it seems medically and ethically justified to edit the embryo and then initiate a human pregnancy with it. That, to be clear, is, is specifically the hot button item. It's not uh, editing embryos in research. It's, it's, uh, it, it's not uh, uh, editing sperm cells and egg cells without creating embryos or without initiating pregnancies. And I think another important part of the, the position is uh, we think governments and ultimately each nation will need to decide for themselves uh, what the, the right uh, set of conditions are under which they might contemplate allowing uh, such a practice. But we think until that governance structure uh, has had time to be thoughtfully constructed, uh, now is a good time to say maybe we should stop uh, creating edited children, uh, which happened much faster than I think most people thought it would, especially when there is no sort of thoughtful unmet medical need that was addressed by the case that was uh, was presented. Yeah, human human germline editing has the potential to quite profoundly change the direction of our society, um, and and there are different types of or different um, levels of ge uh, germline editing that that people may consider. On one hand, um, there may be a mutation that is known to cause a disease. And in that case, the desire would be to revert that mutation back to what is found in most people, um, the sort of the wild type uh, version of that sequence. <clears throat> that is, for, for many people, um, e more easily acceptable. And then if you go up a notch, um, then it's about genetic enhancement, putting something that has never existed in the human gene pool uh, into the genome to create um, more diverse uh, information uh, in, in the human uh, race, in the human population. Uh, if you think about um, the effort that parents go through to get their kids into college, <laughs> um, if the ability um, to enhance the genome for whatever arbitrary criteria uh, that may exist uh, is possible, um, our biology, our understanding of biology is not there yet. So even if we want to make many of those enhancements, uh, we actually don't know how to do that. But assuming in the future science will progress to a certain level, and that is there, um, how does the society um, adapt to accommodate that? Um, does the society um, you know, move forward with that? And that is something that will require the whole society as a whole uh, to, to have um, discussions and, and to reach consensus uh, before we, we move forward. And so the moratorium is to encourage people to discuss and, and for society to, to gather um, for uh, multiple stakeholders uh, or all the stakeholders to have discussions to reach consensus um, before we move forward. Consensus doesn't mean that every single individual has to agree, but it does mean that um, there has to be um, an informative and, and thoughtful discussion uh, and a process um, to, to uh, decide what to do. And that seems as good a point as any to wrap up the evening. I'm sure David and Fon will stick around for your questions afterwards, but give them a hand.